and we are now ready to begin. So thank you everybody for joining us today for this webinar, Same DACH and Real-Time Payments, Uncovering Their Key Differences. Our presenters are Colin Adams of Lipis Advisors and Austin Winters of ACI Worldwide. And now I'm going to hand things over to Colin Adams to get us started. Uh, excited to share uh, the results here uh, of this work. Um, I want to just start off real quick, <clears throat> um, just a bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about uh, today. Um, so I'm going to start off giving a bit of an introduction of, of real-time payments and some of the questions that banks um, are, are at the U.S. banks in particular are asking themselves I think, uh, to, to make the case and, and sort of figure out um, a plan to move to real-time. Then we want to give a bit of an overview of, what, of um, sort of concretely what we were looking at and what we actually did, our sort of methodology for this project. Uh, and then we want to move in a bit to um, looking at first a, a comparison of the differences between uh, same day ACH and real time payments. Uh, and from there, once we understand a bit better of how they differ, because it's not just about speed, uh, as, as we'll discover today, um, a bit into the use cases and what are the optimal scenarios uh, for each payment type. From there, I'm going to hand it over to Austin. Uh, he's going to uh, take us through some of the uh, research API has done uh, about forecasting the real-time opportunities in the U.S., uh, as well as, you know, through, through API's experience in helping banks in this space, um, how do you actually um, turn this opportunity into um, actually revenue and, and, and a sort of a business case uh, and how you can sort of modernize uh, using real-time payments. So to start off here, um, just looking uh, specifically at the United States. Um, so one of the core issues that sort of drove us to uh, actually look into these use cases uh, is the fact that, um, you know, in the U.S., as in a few other markets, the move to real-time payments is actually voluntary. So there's not a, a mandate that banks need to join a real-time system. This is, of course, happening uh, in, in an environment where there's actually also been improvements to the ACH system. So as of September of last year, uh, ACH credits are, are same day. Uh, later this year, a direct debit will move to same day. So again, we're seeing increased speed in the ACH system at the same time as we're uh, building real time in the United States. So I think for uh, U.S. banks, uh, they're asking us a couple questions here. We have sort of the, some of the three biggest ones here. So first off is, is what's the business case? So how do you actually determine uh, whether or not uh, you should move, uh, you as a bank should be moving and actually adopting, uh, joining real-time systems and offering real-time products and services to your customers? Uh, obviously, in order to make that business case, uh, you have to ask yourself how much added value does a real-time system bring when you already have same day ATH? So again, if you're looking at it from a speed perspective, uh, you know, ACH is already faster, uh, what can real-time bring? And we're going to look into a few of the other characteristics, uh, you know, obviously because of the name real-time, uh, speed tends to be the sort of marquee factor there, but there are a couple other factors there. So again, the question is how much can you add with real-time compared to same-day ACH? And I think what, what sort of comes out of that is, is the question of, you know, uh, how long to wait? Do you wait until real time becomes compulsory? Do you wait until a few other uh, players in the market uh, move that way? And I think what we're looking at here with the, with the use cases and the actual uses of the system, um, we hope that that can help uh, banks in the U.S. And, and in other markets as well uh, really ask some of these uh, pertinent questions and, and, and start to get at uh, to help their business case and their plan for actually adopting real-time payments. So, um, again, first, first we want to just look at and, and differentiate a little bit between same ACH and real-time payments because, as we said, it's not just about speed. I want to just begin here uh, by um, by uh, sharing a bit from so my company, Lipis Advisors. Uh, some of you may know us, some of you may not. Uh, we're a payments consultant team. We've done a lot of research around the world uh, in uh, both high and low value payments, and including all of the uh, 19 countries that currently have real-time, operating real-time payment systems, as well as a few of the markets that are moving to it now. Uh, what we've heard uh, 
from a lot of different players in these markets is that real time is inevitable. Now, that's an easy thing to say, but the, but the question is when will it come and when will it reach critical mass in some cases? Uh, we, we see with the U.S. as well as with uh, the Eurozone moving uh, to real-time payments both to go live this year, later in 2017, um, you know, we think that this is really moving the market and, and really brings these questions to the fore. So as I have mentioned before, when you're looking at the differences between same-day and uh, real-time payments, very important here to um, uh, look at more than just speed. So obviously with same-day ACH, you have uh, batch payments uh, that are intraday. So at the end of the day, if you meet the cutoff, you can have them uh, posted uh, to the accounts, whereas real-time payments, by definition, post within seconds. But there's a lot more to it than just that. Um, operating hours is arguably just as big of a change in terms of where banking is moving uh, than speed. So, of course, same day ACH still is working generally in banking business hours, uh, so it's not operating on nights and weekends, whereas real-time payments is 24-7, 365. Uh, and again, many banks, um, you know, some of them might be prepared for this, some of them might not in terms of processing, in terms of posting. Uh, again, that um, is really a big change. So it's not just that things are being posted within seconds and you have to do all your checks and all that, it's that it has to be done nights and weekends, on holidays, uh, all the time. Um, a few of the other big factors, I don't want to go through every single one here, uh, we have this all in the report, uh, but I want to jump down here a bit to the uh, security and convenience factor. Uh, so again, with same-day ACH, you're still using, uh, if you're going to send a payment, uh, using ACH, you're still going to use bank routing numbers, uh, sending both files, usually using uh, increasingly, especially businesses using online uh, channels to do this. So again, you need to know the bank account number of the uh, person or business you're sending a payment to, uh, and you need to also share that information uh, uh, if you're giving out for, for a direct debit, for instance, or if you're giving it to someone to send you a payment. In contrast, what we're seeing with real-time payments in other markets and what, what, uh, what is already in plan in the U.S., for instance, with TCH's system that they're building, um, is a little bit different. So they have what's called a proxy database, or, or they're planning on at least enabling that capability. So what a proxy database does is, of course, it, it enables you to give a different proxy. Usually this is a, a mobile phone number or an email address. Uh, which then through the database gets actually connected to the bank account number. So that actually enables the convenience. Um, so if you think of something like P2P or C2P payments, you can actually, you don't need to necessarily know your bank account number or, or get your bank account number from a friend. You can, something that's, that you already have memorized. Um, and the other thing you have there, of course, is that you're not actually giving out your bank account details. Uh, some people are a bit wary of doing that, uh, and in this case, you can just give your email or your phone number, uh, and that can be then connected to the payment. You could still make the payment using that. Uh, as with Sandy ACH, um, of course, with real-time payments, you use online channels, uh, but what we see increasingly, again, here is mobile payments. Uh, sorting, uh, you know, a lot of people see this real time as an enabler for boosting mobile payments adoption. Again, that, that also goes with the convenience factor where, you know, these days more and more people have smartphones. If you can use that as an initiation channel, that can really boost the, the convenience factor there. Uh, another key difference here is the transparency of payment status. So again, if you're using an ACH payment, um, you won't necessarily uh, have an overview of all of the payments that have been posted and processed until uh, the end of the day. Uh, definitely a big uh, advantage uh, compared to D plus one, which of course if something happens on a Friday, might wait till Monday, um, but it is still end of the day. Whereas with a real-time payment, you have that immediate transparency because what you get is not just that the payment is posted within seconds, it's that the sender, uh, both the sender and the receiver get a confirmation within seconds, right? So the sender knows if the payment has been successful or if it has not been successful. So again, that transparency you have, you know, up to a couple seconds, you know which payments have actually uh, been made uh, or potentially rejected, uh, and there's no waiting until the end of the day to know the status. The last big um, difference you see here with, uh, with the characteristics is uh, in the payment types. So both same day ACH and real time uh, feature uh, traditional push credit transfers. Uh, but in addition to that, they both uh, differentiate with some of the instruments. So the same day ACH, uh, of course, uh, it's not live yet, but in September of this year, direct debits will become same day as well. Uh, and this is actually a very useful payment type uh, 
uh, for a lot of recurring payments, things like utility bills and such. Uh, whereas uh, real-time payments, if we look globally, uh, there are very few systems that actually offer true pull direct debits in real time. I believe there's only one uh, currently in India, uh, and they're only for point of sale, so they're only a very specific type of direct debit. Uh, what you see in a lot of real-time systems and what uh, you see playing in the U.S. Uh, from TCH is uh, what, what they call request for payment. So in this sense, instead of having the beneficiary actually sort of pull the funds from the sender's account, what they do is they initiate uh, a request for the payment. So they send essentially an authorization to the sender. And the sender is able to then say in, in real time, of course, uh, whether or not they agree uh, to making the payment or not. And this actually opens up a whole lot of opportunities that we'll see later, uh, for instance, at the point of sale where a merchant could initiate uh, not the payment itself, but initiate that authorization for the payment. So again, we see a lot of interesting things here. There are, uh, you know, these two uh, system types actually are differentiated more than just speed. So moving from that, um, what we have here is we actually took those characteristics from before and uh, mapped them a bit to these um, admittedly a bit broad uh, use case categories. Uh, again, we're going to go into a bit deeper dive here of the categories in, in subsequent slides. Uh, but what we want to do here is look here at, at um, how these uh, different characteristics um, can play out in these different use cases. Uh, and again, I mean, this is, a, a, I think, a very rich slide of information. You'll see in the report that you can take a look at this and read the, the uh, report alongside it. But what we have here is we, we just want to look at a couple of these factors here. So one of the first ones, as I mentioned before, the fact that real-time payments uh, are 24-7, 365. Um, this offers a lot of benefits uh, to payments that have consumers involved, right? So here, P2P and C2B payments in terms of the consumer initiating it. Um, you know, increasingly, when it comes to nights and weekends or on holidays, um, you know, a lot of other payment types might offer a bit of a real-time experience, even if the funds aren't immediately available. So particularly in P2P space, that becomes very important. Or perhaps if someone's buying something from a small retailer, actually knowing that those funds are there is important. So again, compared to ACH and, and other legacy payment systems, Real-time offers uh, some added benefits there that make very clear and obvious use cases just from the sense of it being around 24-7. Um, and moving a bit down here uh, to the other three uh, rows that are circled, uh, we're looking here a bit more at um, how real-time payments can help actually open up some business use cases. As we'll, as we'll discuss later, um, this can be a very uh, a key feature for banks in determining, um, you know, the benefits to them and their customers about um, real-time payments is how it can open up new uh, business payments. So again, with the security and convenience feature, particularly with proxy databases, um, this uh, opens up a lot of new functionality uh, for C to B and B to C, particularly ad hoc payments, right? Payments that aren't necessarily scheduled, uh, where they can be paid immediately, conveniently, and of course, um, very necessary here, securely. Um, moving in, as well as in the payment types, we see a similar thing, especially with requests for payment, um, this can actually be uh, a big benefit here once you get in the C2B and B2C space, and I think moving on, you'll see in the B2B space. Um, again, this is uh, an area particularly with things like, um, you know, B2C that they can actually be very helpful with San Diego H having direct debits, but having that request for payment option uh, adds uh, a bit more, uh, and we'll give you some examples of that a bit later on. And of course, in terms of transparency, again, in the C2B and B2C space, particularly with these ad hoc payments, um, the fact that you know up to the second uh, which payments have been posted and, and settled, um, you know, real time offers uh, added functionality here, um, you know, I think across all these use cases. But again, for, for a bank looking strategically uh, and, and how they might approach this uh, in the C2B and B2C space, there, there are big opportunities here. So that's just a bit of an overview here. Uh, we're going to get into more detail uh, in, in these upcoming slides. But first, uh, I just want to jump in here and, and take a look at uh, some of the improvements and some of the, the method of payment flow through uh, the ACH system, because we now with that it's same day ACH. Again, only credits for the moment. Later this year, direct debits will also move to same day as well. 
So these numbers here, this, uh, these are figures that we got directly from NAPSHA, um, and this is a Q1 of 2017. And uh, we've, we've seen a bit of an evolution. I think there was some immediate, um, after it went live in September, uh, we saw a similar looking chart, but we've actually seen it develop a bit more. So uh, the first thing that jumped out, of course, uh, in Sunday ACH is BZ payments, direct deposit, um, paying salary payments. Uh, that is, you know, just over half of all the payments here, um, as well as then the B2B payments, making about a third. So you see when businesses are making these payments, uh, ACH is serving them well uh, and continuing to serve them well. As you'll see here uh, with P2P and C2B, um, it, it's still uh, a, a relatively small chunk of the transactions you see in same day ACH systems. But I think you know this graphic is is I think a good visual representation of of you know the fact that this has continued to be very well served for ACH payments for in some cases. Uh, many of those are recurring payments or sort of scheduled uh, payments made during business hours. Um, and, and again, keeping in mind that now that we've moved to same day ACH, uh, there's actually been uh, added benefit to that uh, in actually unlocking some working capital, having the funds flow faster. Um, so when we're looking to where real time opportunities are, um, you know, we're going to look not necessarily at some of these recurring payments. Uh, and we're going to look a bit as well into things like some of these bill payments that we see here uh, on in, with 2%. So again, I want to move in a bit to, to the use cases. And, and just to start off here, I don't want to focus too much on uh, P2P, but I think it is worth uh, bringing up here um, because P2P offers a very clear and immediate opportunity for real-time payments. We do see a fair amount of flows going through standard ACH with that 12%. Uh, but once you uh, institute real-time payments and have banks uh, adopting the system, and again, TCH already has uh, a bunch of banks already testing and getting ready to, to go live with this, um, these characteristics that we went through earlier just make it um, a very clear use case. So we have the speed. We have the 24-7 uh, operating hours. We have that up to the second transparency. Um, so new channels or at least sort of underused channels such as mobile, uh, things like the request for payment and continue to have that security and convenience. Um, so again, this is an obvious uh, use case where banks can uh, use real-time payments for their uh, for their customers, but I think the real challenge, uh, as as we're we're looking into the other areas, is how banks can drive the business use of real-time payments, and that's what we really want to focus on here. And we're going to start off uh, just looking at uh, C2B pay use cases. So again, as, as I mentioned before, C2B, uh, B2C, B2B, they're all somewhat. Um, uh, high level in terms of, you know, they're, they're pretty general use case category. So what we want to do here is dig down a bit deeper. So when it comes to ACH in general, and particularly same-day ACH, um, recurring payments and sort of scheduled payments, uh, they are um, very good use cases for same-day ACH. Again, you have the use of direct debits, which again, later this year will go live with same-day ACH. If you think back to the pie chart from a few slides ago, that's just for same-day ACH. Uh, so even though the, the slice of C2B payments is relatively small, uh, we expect that to grow uh, when uh, we, uh, same day direct debits goes last. Things such as utility bills. Again, the a customer, they know every month they're paying the same amount. They can either set up that standing order or give a direct debit mandate to the biller. Uh, these are things where ACH works well and there's been improvements moving to, to, to same day speed. So when you're looking at real-time payments and the opportunities there, uh, what we're seeing more is um, for sort of ad hoc or variable payments. Uh, this is a real big opportunity for ACH. So one of the examples here, we have merchant payments uh, at the point of sale uh, or, or e-commerce as well, particularly those for uh, smaller retailers. Um, particularly, you know, many smaller retailers will see uh, perhaps card interchange fees uh, might be a bit high. Uh, the in, the um, introduction of real-time payments can uh, enable them to accept electronic payments, not have to rely on cash, uh, and potentially at lower cost. Uh, what we also see are things like uh, expedited bill payments. So it's not just recurring bill payments. It could be variable bill payments, such as cell phone bills. It might not be the same every year uh, or every month, rather, um, or um, perhaps 
sort of last minute to still pay, right? If you have forgotten to or because of, you know, um, you didn't have the funds, it's, you know, your credit card payments or any other sort of bill payment uh, that you need to pay at the last minute, you can be sure that it's paid, it's confirmed, and you know uh, you don't have to worry about any sort of same-day cutoff, right? You can pay that immediately. Uh, these are some of the areas where, where um, real time can bring added value. Um, you also, another big thing here is it's not just about the payment per se, especially when you're using uh, new channels like mobile uh, to make the payments. Uh, you can integrate the payment with uh, other apps or schemes. So, for instance, you can, you can integrate it with uh, electronic bill presentment, uh, presentment and payment system where you can sort of have the invoice and the payment connected into one or another big opportunity we see uh, increasingly is merchant loyalty schemes, okay? You cannot just you, you can have the, your customer, if you're a merchant, you can have your customer not only make the uh, real-time payment with their mobile phone, but you can integrate that with some loyalty scheme uh, that can enhance the customer experience, perhaps uh, keep them coming back in the store, uh, and again, making it easier for the customer, making it as seamless as possible, uh, and having that easy experience uh, can only benefit them, the merchant, and therefore any bank that can offer that to their uh, corporate customers, their merchant customers, uh, could see um, you know, increased customers, uh, enhancement of service to them, and perhaps uh, selling additional services. Moving on here uh, to B2C use cases. So this is, um, in some ways, a similar story. So again, we're talking any sort of recurring payment um, is still going to be really good for, for the ACH. We mentioned before salary payments via direct deposit, making up just over half of all the payments in San Diego ACH today. Um, again, it offers, ACH continues to offer the convenience, certainty, and then additional speed as well. Um, again, these sort of recurring payments are great, um, perfectly tailored, or rather ACH is perfectly tailored for those. Where real time can come in and offer that additional benefit is where um, you need added flexibility, right? You need that immediacy of funds reusability. And when these are the key considerations, uh, this uh, real time can actually offer this added value. So again, a couple examples here. Um, you know, imagine if you're uh, an insurance company and you have a claims adjuster out in the field. Uh, they can immediately disperse funds uh, to, to their clients. Uh, again, oftentimes this can happen, especially in insurance. You never know when. It could be a midnight or a weekend or when a disaster strikes. Um, again, being able to offer this additional functionality uh, can, can sort of raise customer satisfaction and thereby uh, the banks that can offer this to the businesses that do this uh, can really uh, see, see increased satisfaction of their own customers. Another area with real time, again, the payment of temporary uh, or freelance workers. Uh, or we can also add seasonal workers to this, right? So we have, we're increasingly moving to a freelance economy um, where, uh, you know, you don't necessarily, you're not only paying salaried workers, uh, and for a business to be able to offer um, maybe at the end of the day or at the end of the week to pay someone who's just there on a temporary or freelance basis uh, can, can be a big advantage uh, both to them and to the, the worker themselves. So again, uh, it's this idea of flexibility, um, 24-7 availability and the immediacy of funds, that's increasingly becoming relevant for businesses uh, that are paying out, uh, out to consumers uh, here in this space. The last area we're looking at here, B2B. Uh, obviously, this is a um, really big uh, use case and, and a big sort of area uh, for banks and their corporate customers. Um, it's actually interesting with the move to San Day ACH, we've actually talked to some folks and we've heard that they've actually, um, a couple of corporate treasurers at some, uh, some larger uh, corporates um, have really been pleasantly surprised at the speed uh, of funds receivable. Uh, perhaps they weren't fully aware of San Diego ACH or the implications of that, but knowing that, hey, we're receiving our funds uh, quicker, this is, this is a big benefit to us. Um, one of the reasons why this is so good as well is because large corporates in particular, um, you know, they've been using ACH for a while. It's been, uh, you know, implemented into their ERP systems. They know how to use it. They, they sort of understand it, and, and, and it sort of has been integrated into their own business processes. So for a lot of these payments, let's say it's large supplier payments, for instance, um, you know, uh, ACH and now Sandy ACH offering that added speed um, is uh, still uh, works really well and will likely continue so uh, for the near future. 
Where real time uh, can come in is um, actually offering it can actually open up new segments. Uh, so one of the air, one of the areas that is often sort of underserved is SMEs. Um, this is a really attractive community for real time payments in the short, near to medium term. Oftentimes, SMEs are sort of find themselves caught between being seen as a consumer or as a corporate. You know, they're not they're bigger than consumers, but they're you know they have more advanced needs than consumers, but maybe not quite as advanced as large corporates. So, with using real time payments, this can actually open up a space for banks to actually serve a new segment better and offer these new products and services. So again, one of the examples we've heard is, um, you know, if you think about a small retailer that's selling um, high-priced consumer goods, for example, kitchen equipment, if you're selling someone a refrigerator, they purchase it. Um, you know, the way it is today is that, you know, that uh, supplier, the retailer, has to actually have that inventory on either in the store or at a warehouse. They have to sort of own that. Um, and then they can supervise it and they, and they deliver it. Um, what we've actually heard anecdotally in a few other markets for, for these types of retailers and these some sort of expensive consumer goods uh, is that they don't have to hold as much inventory. What they can do is hold one or two, uh, ex you know, examples of models of each of the things that they're selling. Uh, when a consumer wants to buy a refrigerator, for instance, what the retailer can do is immediately pay the supplier with a real-time payment they get that immediate confirmation the same day, and then they can send it out for delivery uh, this bar either on that day or the next day. So the consumer sees no difference. They're going to have it delivered anyway. Uh, but for the um, small retailer, that can save enormously on inventory costs and, and actually use that capital to expand their business in other ways. Um, but this isn't only about small businesses. If we look a bit further down the road, um, you know, in the medium term, for instance, um, the fact that ISO 20022 is being used, uh, for instance, in TCH's real-time system and in many other real-time systems around the world, it seems like pretty much every real-time system that's been built over the past couple of years is using ISO 20022. So if you think about these larger corporates that are often um, present in, in many markets around the world, uh, the fact that you can use the same payment standard in different markets uh, does two things. One, it's operational efficiency. You don't have to, you know, you can sort of harmonize your operations when it comes to payments messaging and such uh, across these different markets. Uh, and then a little bit further down the road, you could imagine there actually being some interoperability between real-time systems in different markets because they're based on the same standard. Uh, so again, we're not saying that this is a pressing use case uh, here or a pressing segment to look at, but again, these are just the considerations to keep in mind. Um, it's, it's the real-time payment that can help unlock new segments. Um, it's the operational efficiency you can afford a larger corporates through the use of ISO 20022, and then looking a bit to the future uh, that uh, as barriers continue to uh, you know, dissolve a bit and, and uh, commerce continues to become more global, uh, that can add additional value so that you're not just targeting SMEs, but also larger corporates as well. So um, I want to hand it off uh, to Austin right now. Um, he's going to go through some of the research ACI has done and some of the experience ACI has had working in uh, multiple markets, serving banks, and actually um, sort of delivering or helping deliver uh, real-time solutions. Thanks, Colin. Appreciate that. Um, what I'd like to do in our remaining time is build on that great background that Colin has given us, but, but maybe take a little closer look um, for the customer and revenue opportunities in this emerging space of faster payments. As Colin pointed out, there are multiple schemes of accelerated payments that have or are emerging in the U.S. market. And frankly, as, as, as we discussed earlier, too, the fact that it's not mandated actually creates some complexity and uncertainty um, in, the, in the U.S. markets for us. And, you know, given that, we want to acknowledge that there are these multiple payment schemes, but we're going to take our time and continue to focus on uh, same-day ACH and real-time payments um, uh, that the TCH is, is um, uh, bringing to the market. We'll touch on a few others as we go through, but that will be our primary focus. So what we really want to do is start to frame and size the markets for these payments, you know, by considering same-day activity that um, Colin's already reviewed through the first quarter. We'll look at TCH's projections, and we'll also see what we can learn from the UK's experience um, with faster payments um, to date. So, again, TCH has not gone live, as, as, as we all know. Um, it's targeted to go live in Q3 this year. 
Um, and what we'd like to suggest is that you use this, these projections um, to begin to think about how you'll frame your business cases. So we have actual same-day ACH activity, um, we have projected uh, TCH activity here, and I th the thing we really want to point out that I think is very interesting is that these emerging, these emergent payment schemes seem to be picking and positioning themselves for certain markets. There's not a 100% overlap. And in TCH, for example, the focus seems to be on transactions that have a, a, a business component. Um, so the only, in fact, the only, in the projections you see here on the screen, uh, on this chart, only the orange section um, portrays anticipated P2P um, transactions. So as Colin did, we'll continue to focus in the remainder of this chat um, on those transactions that have a, a business component. Again, acknowledging one of the other major players in the market, Zell, um, their focus seems to be primarily on P2P with some slight nod to B2C transactions. But so we're acknowledging that there are other, other payment schemes, but again, saying that we, in the time we have here, we're gonna focus on, um, on these two. Uh, just finishing up with TCH projections, um, TCH is anticipating that they'll have a reachability to 50% of the U.S. deposit base by the end of uh, 2018. So it'll give you some mile, milestones or, or mile markers to, um, to begin to start to have our conversation. So one is, this is this this day that we see on this slide uh, reflects the activity over the past eight years um, in the UK. Um, certainly, want to acknowledge that the UK market is 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 different than the US. Um, while doing that, though, we think it would be an uh, equally tragic mistake to to not learn lessons that we can from what what they've experienced over there in the past uh, eight years. So first of all, the growth is just um, impressive and, and continues in, in the last year to grow at a, at a, spa, at a pace of uh, 13%. The thing on this slide I really wanted to point out, though, is this is a mandated scheme, of course, and it's mandated to apply to all use cases, P2P, C2B, and, and all the use cases that we've talked about. Given that, note that the high percentage of business transactions, 43%, um, um, our business transaction. We think that's where uh, revenue is gonna be drawn and we'll continue to focus on that in the remainder of our time here. One of the other things, again, continuing to chat a little bit about the uh, UK fast payments experience is these, faster, these new payment schemes don't exist in a vacuum. They are being added to an, eco an existing ecosystem with a variety of payment types. And there's been a lot of discussion and, um, frankly, um, uh, gnashing of teeth and, and concern about what the introduction of new payment type might do to existing volumes. And this is where I think we can perhaps learn some, um, learn some, some things. Uh, just a level set, uh, BAX is the uh, UK's equivalent of ACH, CHAPS is the UK's equivalent of Fedwire, um, checks, and then faster payments on the far right. Note that in the most recent year um, that we have data for, 2014 to 15, that even while faster payments on the right is growing at a clip of 13%, ACH or BACS is continuing to grow at 4%. Wire CHAPS is continuing to grow at 2.8%. Um, those are statistics that are not all that different than um, the U.S.'s growth in those areas, um, even without um, uh, a mandated faster payment scheme. So we'd like to suggest that um, there is room for multiple payment types in, in the marketplace, and we should continue to, um, to look at it in that way. So let's get a little bit more, uh, turn our attention a little bit more to how we turn some of this information into um, uh, anticipated you know, revenue streams and, and uh, profitability. So first off, um, this is some data that we gathered from the UK market. Um, this is publicly available data, I, I, uh, I'm quick to add, um, based on pricing for um, the SME marketplace. And these are ranges, and certainly my, my point is not to suggest that these are prices that uh, we all ought to consider, but rather to indicate that, you know, two things, that 
um, there is value associated with these, and the markets are willing to uh, to pay for it. Um, and also to point out the positioning of of the payments in this ecosystem. So again, um, we talked about you know, Chaps being equivalent to Fedwire, um, and we can see that you know the range of pricing there. Um, at the bottom, uh, Bax is the ACH, and through no surprise, you'll see that faster payments fits um, from a pricing point of view um, right between them. And uh, what I've done is provided U.S. equivalents in the far right-hand um, column. What I inserted also is, is perhaps what I think, at least in my mind, is a logical positioning for same-day ACH in this spectrum. So in the United States, um, you could – one view would be to reasonably put ACH between uh, – same-day ACH, rather, between uh, classic ACH and, and real-time payments. And some of the pricing that we've seen um, – um, indicative price that we've seen uh, fits that bill. Um, so again, not to suggest this is uh, pricing that we want to consider, but to suggest rather the the, uh, the ranking of the position, relative positioning in this payment ecosystem, and and that there is value, and that the markets, the small business markets in particular, are willing to pay um, for the value of real time payments and same day ACH. So. You know, these are sort of our, our, our views on some of this. This is um, an, an opportunity for you to weigh in and, and um, provide your input on what you think the um, impact of introduction of a, of a real-time payment scheme will be in the U.S. Um, you know, do we think that that will cause ACH transactions to decline? Do we think that um, uh, RTGS or wire transactions will decline? Um, debit and credit transactions will decline? Uh, check. And then finally, uh, do we think that this will be net new activity, and you can answer with more than one. We'll pause for a minute. Chris, let me know when, when you're ready to close. Sure, uh, yeah. Oh. yeah, I can see there's a number of folks that are in progress uh, entering their, their details. Uh, as soon as you are done, click Submit. We're going to give it just a few more seconds. And then I'm going to go ahead and share those results in just a moment. <clears throat> Sorry for the wait. The system is tabulating. Okay. You should be able to see on your screen now the results of the. Okay. Paul. <laughs> Interesting that um, it looks like uh, the, the, the prevailing opinion seems to be there will be most impact on ACH um, trans transfers uh, being reduced, followed by uh, the idea that there will be net new activity. And, and I think that would be supported by what we've seen in the uh, UK. Wire followed next, and then checks, which have been declining already. Um, and I think that that the, the the move to checks um, for efficiencies is, is was was already underway, and this perhaps will accelerate it. So excellent. We'll appreciate that feedback. Thank you. So moving on, we we've looked at transaction activity projections and experience in other countries, but let's look at another barometer on how we might value, or how, but or more importantly, how we think our markets might value accelerated payments. And we'll take a look at um, – we'll reference some work that um, Barlow has done, and then separately ACI in partnership with YouGov. So first I'll start off with something that shouldn't surprise most of us, that small to medium enterprises make up 99% in numbers of all the businesses worldwide, and that represents about $57 billion in annual, annual revenue. So in, in partnership, um, that's from Barlow. Um, ACI, in partnership with YouGov, surveyed many of these uh, in the United States as well as in Europe. Um, the other thing that, um, about how they view real-time payments, and we found it was very interesting to note that in the U.S. in particular, 65% of the SMEs say they would switch providers um, for the offer of real-time services. 38% would say that real-time payments um, would be essential to their bits of the success, excuse me, success of their businesses, and 
say that real-time payments will improve the business processes related to a payment receipt. Um, and again, I, I don't think any of those are, are tremendously surprising, but I think they, they substantiate the fact that um, SMEs find value in the notion of um, accelerating and speeding up um, payments. I think the other thing that's um, relevant or important to keep in mind is that the, the payment ecosystem is getting more complex. Uh, we're not really eliminating any payment types, we're adding new ones. And this is gonna create uh, challenges for our customers um, in trying to determine which ones are appropriate for given cases, which means it's gonna uh, put a burden on service providers to be able to rationalize um, what payment's appropriate and, and help our customers understand um, that what, what these different payment types are. And there's evidence um, to suggest in this YouGov study that 81% of these SMEs have little or no awareness of the immediate payment activities going on in the U.S. And this is somewhat borne out, too, by um, same-day ACH, um, which is now live, and there's feedback to indicate that there's not a wide understanding in the marketplace of that payment option as well. So I think for any of us to be successful here, uh, the lesson there is, is that we need to step our game up in terms of um, uh, communicating with our customers and helping them um, understand these emerging complexities in, in the uh, payment ecosystem. So I'm not going to go into this next slide uh, in great detail. Um, Colin reviewed a lot of the business cases and use cases. I, I wanted to focus on two here and, and take some of our time, remaining time, to, to drill into uh, two in particular, um, request for payment and bill pay. And, and Colin touched on those. Uh, I'm going to drill a little bit deeper, and I'm going to pair those, if you will, um, and, and focus on um, this bill pay or C to B um, um, aspect. So in this slide, you'll see at the top the, the pie chart that shows the ACH activity um, for same day ACH through um, Q1 2017 that Colin showed us earlier. Again, focusing in on that 2%, only 2% that's being used for C to B or bill pay. And we think for immediate payments, there's a real opportunity um, here, and especially when you pair the request for payment. So, you know, the use case would be in step one, you know, a biller um, generates um, a request for payment and, and sends that to the, um, to the consumer or the business who needs to pay the bill. The, the, one of the value adds here, and we think there's, there's both efficiencies and, and fee and or income uh, a, a potential here, is that request for payment can be more than just a request. It can, it, has, it can carry a payload. It can carry a bill for a consumer. It can carry an invoice for a business. Once that business or consumer receives the request for payment, which is just that, a request, and it would be received real time, um, the option is then to respond to that by originating a credit transfer. Um, and that does a lot of things. One, it's, it's tremendously convenient for the recipient. Um, it's very, it, it improves efficiencies for the originator by tightly linking the invoice and or um, um, bill to the payment. Um, and, and that simplifies um, reconciliation issues. So looking at, again, some of those, some of those benefits on, on both sides of that equation, um, it is guaranteed. So some of the schemes, and I'll, uh, you know, won't reference any specifically, but these are immediate and they are guaranteed or irrevocable. Um, the simplified accounting I referenced uh, by linking the, um, uh, the invoice and the bill to, um, to the payment, which, which um, simplifies and improves uh, efficiencies around reconciliation. Um, to, if some of these, some of this volume, as some of you in the survey indicated, came from um, checks, you get those ad additional benefits. Um, and then you get the uh, enhanced customer satisfaction um, that, that you get with the um, uh, transparency of, of a real-time confirmation. Same thing over the consumer side, they get control over the cash flow because they don't have to send it in advance. They make sure that the cash is there at the time of the payment. Um, 
they get to see what they're paying for by looking at either the bill or the, um, or the invoice. They have a variety, they're not constrained by business hours, um, and they get the immediate confirmation um, and the irrevocability. So, you know, it's in, in many, many ways a win, a win-win uh, deal uh, for that use case. Moving on to sort of summarize a bit, you know, it's going to be crucial for us in the financial services industry to understand the characteristics of all these emerging payment types. And we believe that once you do that, you'll be able to, to match the appropriate ones to the needs of your organization and, more importantly, to your customers. But as, given the uncertainty, particularly in the U.S., um, the, the key here is that you need to build, we believe, you need to build an environment that's able to handle, um, that's flexible enough to handle the complexity and the increasing number of payment types. You, you may not have chosen which payment types you want to offer, but it's a fair bet you're going to add new ones and, and if, if you want to continue to remain competitive. So that we think that, again, as I'll, I'll reiterate, that um, as you make those decisions, you're going to need to bring your customers along, um, that, it, that your success is mutual, and if you don't bring your customers along, they will not uh, and communicate with them about the pros and cons of all the different payment types. Um, they will not use them, and, and uh, that's going to limit, obviously, obviously limit success. Some, this is, these are some of the bullet points we think you ought to consider as, as, um, as you look to building your business case, and we think your business case should carry the assumption um, that there will be multiple payment types, that real-time business um, use cases do co coexist alongside ACH, same to ACH, that they each, um, at least at the moment, have their place and that your system sh and your strategies and plans should keep that factor in, um, um, in mind. Um, obviously, you know, there are competitive advantages from a business, from a, a real-time business case for TCH in particular over closed-party third, um, closed-loop third-party offerings. Um, the whole ubiquity question about uh, being able to reachability, I think, is really, really key. Um, cost savings, I think, will become apparent both to the financial service providers as well as uh, businesses as they take advantage of um, the flexibility in business hours, the standardization, um, the reduction in um, high cost, high touch um, uh, payment types like checks, um, the uh, increased revenue due to new services and use cases. We've talked about some of those that um, um, in particular focused around um, uh, real-time um, uh, request for payments. Um, frankly, the ability to, to um, innovate, and uh, Colin touched on a number of those, and, and, and come up with new uh, approaches and new payment types and new services around those payments. And the wider system modernization, which is going to be essential for any of us to take advantage of, 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 of this complexity and um, a rapidly changing world, I think um, one of the other elements that comes along with the modernization is, is the global interoper interoperability. Um, most of the new payment schemes are, have an eye towards interoperability um, across borders. So we can expect um, that to add pressure, if nothing else, on the U.S. to, to um, move in that direction. So finally, just in, in uh, in conclusion, before we get into um, Q&A, hopefully what we've been able to do today is, is help you understand how uh, same-day ACH and real-time payments can coexist in this uh, modern payments world and some of the ways you might take advantage of emerging um, opportunities. And as you move towards modernizing your payment um, environments and building out your strategies um, for real-time capabilities, both Colin at Lipis Advisors and ACI uh, welcome you to reach out to us for further um, further discussion. Given ACI's experience in supporting five schemes around the world, in particular in the UK, where over 60% of its uh, direct member banks partner with us to connect to faster payments, we can lend consultancy and best practice approaches to help you develop um, the transition to real time. Um, we can help you set goals and priorities and and uh, create a timeline that works for your um, your financial institution. 
So in, 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 in conclusion, before we um, get to the Q&A, we did have one final uh, poll that we would um, like to get feedback on. So um, if you'll take a minute and, um, and answer these, um, that would be appreciated. Great. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Colin. Um, while folks are entering in their poll, I think we can go ahead and transition to the Q&A. Um, if you have a question for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature in your um, window there to submit the question. And I'm going to give it just a moment while questions come in. Okay, uh, here's one. In other countries where they have same-day ACH, have they seen any deterioration in the ACH volume? Right, so uh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, <clears throat> Libits Advisors have done uh, research in, in all of the countries that currently have live real-time systems. Um, Interestingly, and as you saw, you know, Austin presented that earlier, the example of the UK uh, where uh, passive payments volume has grown, uh, that was only showing year to year, 2014 and 2015, but over the, the past few years, um, you know, passive payments volume has grown as well as BACs and CHAS volumes, so, you know, ACH and RTGS volumes. Uh, but this isn't just limited to the UK. Um, if you look at a country like Sweden, um, We've seen this, uh, I believe, in India as well, uh, that um, the, as the volumes uh, grow in the real-time system, sometimes quite significantly, uh, this isn't, um, we don't see evidence of that cannibalizing volume from either wire payments or uh, for ACH payments. Going back to what we were talking about before, um, again, as we can see, oftentimes there are different uses for these. So um, it suggests that it's either potentially taking away volume from uh, some other legacy instruments such as checks. Again, going back to uh, the example of the UK, as we saw often pointed out, um, that check volumes have gone down. Again, that's we don't know if that's causation or correlation. Um, but I think what we see in a lot of places is that it's either taking some payments that used to be made in cash or perhaps enabling new payments. Uh, again, if you're making it easy and making that experience as close to uh, something like cash or even for the customer, if you're making a card payment, knowing that it was approved, that, you know, uh, for a customer perhaps it seems real time, um, again, it's that convenience factor, it's the immediacy, uh, it's the ease with which you can make this payment. Um, so we've seen in actually multiple countries that while real time payments grow, other legacy systems such as ACH and um, wire systems go along with it. Thank you. Okay, here's mm -hmm. another one. Are aliases required to participate in the clearinghouse's real-time system? You want me to take that? Yes. Sure. Um, at the moment, they're not required. Um, um, there are a variety of options um, that are being considered. Um, involving uh, directories um, which are optional at the moment so a lot of a lot of discussion and frankly not limited to just TCH that's that's a sort of an industry trend right now to consider how we can make you know payments easier to use and more secure so the uh, directories and aliases uh, speak to both that convenience and 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 security so at the moment the short answer is no um, but the design allows for it and, and excuse me, discussions continue um, about um, how that would be provided. And, and, and I think they're trying to keep it as open-ended as possible so that the, um, uh, it wouldn't be controlled so much by the uh, TCH, but um, service providers can choose um, what service or if they want to provide their own you know, alias or directory services. Thank you. Okay, here's another one. What new fraud doors are opened up by real-time payments? Um, yeah, I, I can take that one. Um, so I think this is actually a key um, issue that any market that's moving into real-time payments um, is, is going to take up. Um, obviously, as payments speed up and as, again, not forgetting that real-time payments that have that sort of 
uh, irrevocability uh, aspect, uh, this can be a key concern. Uh, so what we've found in some of our research, and uh, we've looked at this specifically in real-time systems, um, and, and I think this actually applies to other payment types as well, um, the, the best way to prevent fraud is to keep the initiation of payments secure. So that includes things like multi-factor authentication, uh, which I think PCH, uh, if I recall correctly, is, is planning for, for the real-time system. Uh, again, making sure that trying to make that initiation of a payment, because as, as we know, payments, real-time payments in particular, tend to be credit push, even if it's a request for payment, that the, the, the payer, the person sending the payment always gets to, at the very least, whether they're initiating the payment themselves or responding to that request, gets to actually be the one that initiates that. So doing things like two-factor authentication, and this can be done in a number of ways. It can be used with multiple devices, having a, uh, perhaps a one, you know, you, maybe you log in or you can use biometrics and having a one-time use pin to send it or that biometric aspect use it. Again, this is where mobile payments and smartphones uh, potentially offer uh, some added security there. Um, but uh, in terms of fraud doors, sure. I mean, I think what you have to do in addition to the things like ensuring more uh, safety and security around the initiation of payments, um, don't forget that real-time payments, although it is, um, you know, it is instant, it happens within seconds, it happens 24-7, uh, 365, so in this case it is a bit different from a lot of legacy payment types. Um, but you're still going to have scheme rules, issues with um, sort of refunds and returns. I think those at, those issues within the payment scheme and between the banks are still going to be there. So it's not just that payments are fast and if, you know, something happens and it's fraudulent, um, you know, uh, tough luck. Uh, it's that, you know, if you can, you know, have these agreements in the scheme rules, you can potentially uh, enable the refunds uh, to happen. But again, I think the best way to sort of prevent that is to enhance the security features around the initiation of the payment itself. And that's what we've seen in a lot of other markets. Uh, and actually, you know, just sort of uh, both anecdotally and in our research, we've seen, you know, uh, when we've asked them, um, whether it's banks or uh, payment system operators that are operating real-time payments, so if we're looking in markets that actually have it already, um, this is actually less of an issue uh, than uh, than we might have otherwise thought, right? So when some markets are looking to move to real time that maybe are worried about the fraud concerns, uh, in practice it usually hasn't been as big of a deal, but that's because you need, because these markets have had these strong uh, initiation, uh, you know, multi-factor authentication aspects in place in addition to the scheme rules that is important for any payment system. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Austin and Colin, as well, uh, for a very informative session. Um, we're going to wrap up here today. Uh, I do want folks to know that if you entered in a question there and we hadn't gotten a chance to get to it, we will follow up with you after the event. Um, so we want to thank you for spending time with us today. We hope you found this webinar informative.